Not what he said. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. We have a lot of scriptures that we have heard that are in scripture and we have a lot of phrases that we have heard that are not in scripture. The danger is, is we end up building faith blocks on these foundational truths that are not biblical. And when life happens, those truths begin to slide and they take our faith with it because they're not in the Bible. For example, God will never give you more than you can bear. So when you lose your family and friends or something nasty happens in your life, you're sitting there wondering, well, how could God not give me more than I can bear when clearly this is more than I can bear? Therefore, God is a liar. Therefore, my faith cannot be trusted. Because my faith cannot be trusted, I don't need to pray. I don't need to go to church. All these things matter. So that's why this series is so important. That's not what he said. It helps us fall in love with Jesus actually says and what scripture actually says. So we don't build a relationship with a Jesus that we have created in our mind that's not in the scripture. If you're going to quote the scripture, make sure you get it right. So this message this morning, I think it's out of the series of that's not what God said. I think this is probably one of the, the most critical messages um, that I've taught. Um, I think it is, it, it has, it has really, um, it, it will really transform how you view God in your relationship if, if the Lord will help me to do it the right way it needs to be done. So I'm going to pray because I think this message is really important. And I want to make sure I, I am used to do it in the way that it needs to be done. So God, this is to me one of the most critical messages to teach in this church. And I pray that I do it well with your help. So I'll open up my mental faculties to communicate it like you would have me to. That your people would leave here so much better because of it. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to see you too, Kamar, wherever you are. I don't know where you are, but at the end of it, where? where? Oh, great. Good to see you. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And I'm going to read the verse before I give you my introduction. Um, so we're going to go, I want you to write the notes because there, there's quite a bit. So you're going to write 2 Corinthians 10 verse 13. You're going to write 2 Corinthians 11, 16 through 33. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1 verse 6 through 9. And then I'm, I'm going to dive a little bit in Matthew, but not too much. Matthew 1 through 19. So, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 and 13. 2 Corinthians 11, 16 through 33. 2 Corinthians 1, 6 through 9. Okay? So, we're going to talk about the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul is, um, used to be called Saul. Um, he used to kill Christians, persecute them. John Dimash, he used to really kill Christians, and then he decided that he wanted to turn his life around by the drawing of the Spirit of God. He wasn't looking for God, God was looking for him. And most people say, one of the things that you hear is, I'm so glad that God found me. No, or people say, I'm so glad I found the Lord. You'll never see that in scripture. We didn't find him, he found us. God was never lost. We were lost, okay? So, so here it is. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 13 is the verse. You ever hear, you had a funeral and they say, well, God will never give you more than you can bear. Well, that's not what the scripture says. Because that's not what God was trying to extend to us. God was trying to help us understand that, no, beloved, there will be times where in the, your life where it will seem like, um, it will seem like, yeah, you have way more than you could ever be able to bear. And that's, that's something that you need. Oh, my bad. It's 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, not 2 Corinthians. I was wondering why that looked funny. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 13. My bad. 
So verse 12 says, that this is lessons from Israel's idolatry that Paul is writing. The church of Corinth was off the chain. Let me give you the setup. Church of Corinth is off the chain. Corinth is like Miami with the speed of Vegas, right? With the people of New York. So it's got everything going on. And one of the challenges that Paul was having was that in the church, they had prostitutes, they had all these different, like they would leave the church, go pick up a prostitute, and then they would think like they're good, they'd have worship and then go worship with prostitutes. And Paul's like, yo, y'all can't do that. And they're like, why not? What's wrong with it? And Paul's like, yo, do you not know that if you join with a harlot, you are one? And they had all different types of issues. They, they had marital issues. That's why Paul was addressing them in 1 Corinthians chapter number seven, because they were like, yo, like we, the culture is telling us to sleep around and Paul's like, listen, it's better to marry than to burn. And he's trying to help navigate. Corinth was just one of them churches that just had a lot of problems. That's why their book is so bad and so long. And then after he got done with the first letter, he was like, oh Lord, I got to write y'all a second letter because they didn't get it. And so he writes to them, but first Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12 says, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. That's important. Don't look down on anybody, church, because if you think you're standing strong, be careful that you don't fall. The temptation in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. That's where we twist it from. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so you can endure. And the word temptation there in its Greek wording is the word test. God will give you a test and show you a way out. But we have said that God will never give you more than you can bear, which has dangerous implications because all Satan needs to do is give you enough truth with a little lie that can be deceptive. So if I tell you, come follow Jesus, get saved, and if you follow God, he will never put more on you than you can bear. You're like, yes, I want to be saved, absolutely. I promise you, church, God will never give you more than you can. Oh, amen, praise the Lord. And then cancer hits your body. And then your mama dies and your daddy dies, and you're like, well, wait a minute, I thought you told me that God will not give me more than I can bear. Here it is. Let's go to um, 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse, verse 16 through 33. I'm not going to read all of it. This is the apostle, the guy who, got, who God picked and said, I want to use you to do my work. Now, he weren't looking for God. God was looking for him. So God picks him, tells him, I want you. This is Paul giving a, a biography of all of the things that he went through serving Jesus. This is why it's very dangerous when we tell people, come follow Jesus, your life will be so much better. That is true in one sense, but it gives this idea that I will not have any challenges, I have no trials. And then when I do start to realize that when when I signed up to serve Jesus, I found out that my life seemingly got worse in one regard, but I had more peace in another. That's why it's important that we teach Jesus in balance because a lot of people fell out of love with a Jesus that we told them about that didn't match the description. So for, this is Paul. Everybody who wants to be an apostle, who's running around trying to be a bishop and pastor and all that type of stuff, Paul gives his definition of what he's been through. And he says, and since I don't want to boast about my achievements, after all, you, if you think you are wise, but you enjoy putting up with fools. You put up with it when someone enslaves you, takes everything you have, takes advantage of you, takes control of everything, slaps you in the face. I'm ashamed to say that we've been too weak to do that. But whatever they dare to boast about, I'm talking like a fool again. I dare to boast about it too. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. He's given his resume. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? So am I. I know I sound like a madman, but I have served God far more. I have worked harder. Listen to this. This is the apostle. I have been put in prison more often been whipped times without number, faced death again and again. Five different times, the Jewish leaders, five different times, five different times, the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. 
Now, these lashes were not like, um, you know, your mom tell you go outside and get a switch. Th these were leather with metals on them and they would whip you and it would hit your skin and it would leave marks on your skin. And he says, five different times I had to endure that. You mean to tell me that don't seem like God will put more on you than you can bear? In addition to that, I had to go to jail, not for saying what I believe, but saying what God believes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Now, let me insert here. Paul is a much better Christian than me because at some point I would be fighting back. Amen. Praise the Lord. Three times. Now, this is where me and Paul differ because as a black man, I'm not going to be sailing out there on the ship because black people in deep water don't always go together, right? So he says, three times I was shipwrecked. So that means when he was on the sea, his boat broke apart. Can you imagine how scary that is? Can you be on Royal Caribbean and you hear them say, uh, we have an emergency, the ship is breaking apart. You mean to tell me, God, after all that I've done, you're going to let me go through trial after trial after trial. And then he says this, I face, da I face danger from rivers. I face dangers from robbers. Paul must have been in the hood too. I have faced danger from my own people. Because that's very true. Your greatest crucifiers are going to be your own people. Your, your enemies are, everybody. Your, most of your enemies are not from without, they're from within. I've faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. How many of you have been sold by a Christian in a business thing and you realize they just use their Christianity to take advantage of you? That's why when people say they want to pray in a meeting, I'm like, okay, no, nah, I don't want to do that. No, I just want to invite the Lord in. He's already here. Because when they pray, they get you off guard. Oh, you're a Christian? Okay, what do you want to do? All right, so here it is. Um, he says, I have longed and worked enduring many sleepless nights any great listen to what i'm saying any great person who wants to be great will endure sleepless nights you can't be great and sleep well because greatness don't let you sleep okay let me, let me okay all right he, he says um i have i have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food I have shivered in the cold without even enough clothing to keep me warm. Y'all hearing this? This is in your Bible. Then besides all of this, I have the daily burden of leading the church. And if you ever led church folk, you know what I'm talking about. Who is weak without fe my feeling and weakness? Who is led astray and does not burn with anger. If I boast, I would rather boast about the things that show that I'm weak. So Paul is letting us know clearly that in, in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 6 through 9, he clearly says this, there are times I just feel overwhelmed. I just feel like it's way too much. And I want to free you this morning. Some of you, it is way too much. Now, here's the difference. Sometimes the burdens that are placed on us are not God placing on us. We picked up other people's burdens and put it on ourselves too. You hear what I'm saying? We, we can't save everybody. And if, you, if you're like me, sometimes you get in trouble because you have your own problems and then you go try to rescue everybody else from their own problems. And here's the thing about when you learn how to swim. This is the thing. If someone is drowning and you try to rescue them, they will end up drowning you. So here's what I'm saying. Here's my introduction. I believe this sermon series is one of the most critical due to the fact we build expectations based on information or perceptions. Many are out of alignment with Christ because they have been given information with a good heart but bad information. Many of our leaders or biblical instructors or just believers would proclaim things that may be uplifting but are just wrong, such as on this next praise, God's about to bring you a financial miracle. Because there's a lot of people who did praise and did not get a financial miracle and felt like God lied. Can God do these things? Yes. But it's not a principal thing of Jesus. Don't get me wrong. 
God can do far more on a praise, but it's not a prescription, but often in Scripture, in the words of Jeepaw, a description of what God did. So, so what's what it means? Sometimes you see things in the Old Testament, you're like, this is terrible. God isn't saying that this is a prescription for what I want you to do, sleep with your cousin, sleep with your family. It's a description on how the community was. God doesn't hide the ugliness of the Bible. He allows us to see the ugliness so that we can see that even in ugly seasons, God can still move. I know we have believed cleanliness is next to godliness. It is a powerful thought, but it's not a verse in the Bible. It's not found in Scripture or even in the Maccabees. The Maccabees is an extended translation. However, I need to focus my time with precision on this seeming truth but very detrimental teaching to the longevity of one's faith. We have heard well-intentioned people sing it or say it that God will not put more on us than we can bear. We grow up with this construct and build our most precious faith on this central idea. We worship God or Yahweh, the Hebrew name for God is Yahweh, knowing he will never put more on us than we can bear. Although when I read scripture, I get a sneaky suspicion that God bears quite a bit on the shoulders of those who are called by his name. The greatest of men in history of our world, their struggles seemed immense. Suffering is what made their name great. This morning, I want to prove to you that God can and does seemingly give us more than we can bear with the hope that our hope will not be in our trial, but in our Savior. And then here it is, Paul writes that, God will not give you a temptation that will overtake you, that he'll give you a way of escape. And, and he says he'll give you a test that will help you. But here's the thing. If we believe the lie that God will not put more on us than we can bear, we will miss a lot of the great meaning of suffering. You do know the cross is an emblem of suffering. It's like wearing the electric chamber around your neck. The only reason why we celebrate it is because Jesus redeemed it. He took something that was ugly and made it popular. The electric chair, lethal injection will never be good. It never looks good. But Jesus took something that was ugly and redeemed it. That's what God does. He takes things that are nasty and redeems it. This is why we should pray Lord redeem the time even though the time is ugly even though the time is bad I'm asking you to redeem the time I'm asking you to take something that is ugly and make it work together for my good he didn't say that all things were will just somehow work he said I will make at the end of it all things work together for your good here's what you need to learn life is to be lived in reverse you do not understand the seasons of life until you come out of the season. And, and here it is, and I know you want to be great, and I know you want to be powerful, and I want to advise you on that, that everyone in this room that wants to be great, God will use your life story. He will build a movie script off of your life just so somebody else can be encouraged by your story. That's why we're a body. Your life is truly not your own. It's for God to write on his beautiful canvas what he's trying to do out of your life. And when you stand before God. God will show you how your life transformed people. And even though you're suffering with cancer and you may be in your hospital bed right now and you're saying to yourself, how am I going to make it when the nurses come in and you smile at them and you tell them that the Lord is good. You will use your life. Feel my help. You will use your testimony as a witness that God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think. God will use your suffering and put more on you than you can seemingly bear to bring you into another season of life. It's just not biblical characters. It's natural characters. I remember, let me give a little testimony. I remember, oh, Nate, you hide in the corner. Light-skinned people can't hide. We can't see you like that. So I remember when Nate was at this church and then we had let him go and it was a terrible season. It was a terrible situation. But even in 
that suffering. God used that to position his personal career in a space that it may have never been had he not been removed from a particular place and it didn't feel good while it was happening. It didn't seem good while it was happening but it worked together for God's good. He came back more mature. We came back more wise and we are able to do greater things because God will use your story to advance other people and he's probably helped more people in their personal lives than he would have ever helped them had God not taken him through. And we live in a society that, that wants God to remove the weight from their lives. Let me tell you something. If you want to carry glory, it's got to be heavy on you. The glory's got to be weighty. The word glory is the word kabod. It's a Hebrew word. It means to be heavy. It means to be weighty. You know why you can't sleep at night? Because God is pushing that glory through your life. And if the glory is done right, they won't see you. They will see him. If the glory is done right they won't see you because you'll buckle underneath the weight of the glory they want to thank you but they know that you can't thank me you got to thank God because God gave me this trial not for me but for you but here it is trials have value trials cause us to repent from the sin of self-sufficiency. The reason God puts more sometimes on us than we can feel like we can bear is so that we can stop being self-sufficient, so that we can stop going through our roller decks and saying, I know this person, I know that person. After all Paul has been through, he realizes the only person that can help me is God. After I went through being shipwrecked, after my own people betrayed me, after I've been flogged 39 times, five different occasions, when I was hungry, God was there. When I was cold, God was there. And even though I was shivering, God was there. And you may be saying, well, what type of God is this that he would watch you suffer and not come in and help you? That's the problem with your Christianity. There was a man who had a son that was perfect without spot or wrinkle and the father looked at his son suffering and he turned his back on him and didn't say a word and you and I will be partakers of that same cross. There will be seasons where it seems like God isn't speaking. There will be seasons where it seems like God isn't moving, but we must all share. This is why the body is important, because you get together with other people and you realize that God wants me not to rely upon my own sufficiency. I got a degree, but my degree can't open doors. I'm beautiful, fearfully and wonderfully made. But I still need God. And I, I, don't, I don't appreciate all the stuff that I see in the news. I'm not saying that. Don't get it twisted what I'm saying. But I do appreciate some of it. When I watch the debates, I do appreciate some of it. Because when I watch it, I sit there and say, I really need God. And that's what God wants us to get to. Listen, it does matter who's sitting in the White House. Don't be like the church saying, don't matter who's sitting in the White House. It does matter who's sitting in the White House. But ultimately, beloved, it matters who's sitting in my house. If God ain't in my house, I don't care who's in the White House. I'll go bankrupt and broke. I don't care who is sitting in there. If God ain't in my house, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know how I'm going to keep my mind. And even though you go through all of those things, the Lord says, I will be right there with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be a friend that sits closer than a brother I will not leave you by your side and even though you cry I will cry with you even though you don't know how you're gonna make it I will stand with you because I am the Lord your God I will remain with you. so here it is here it is let me debunk the myth 2nd Corinthians 1 8 says for we do not know we don't want you to be unaware brethren of our affliction that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength 
so that we despaired even our own lives. Y'all see this in the scriptures. I, 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 I come up from a, a praying mama. Um, she prays a lot. I called her the other day. I called her in the morning. And I said, Mom, what you doing? She said, um, I'm going to call you back. I'm praying. I said, it was 12 o'clock. I called her at 7. She said, I got to call you back. I said, why? She said, I'm on another prayer call. I started thinking, I need to get my life together with Jesus. Cause <laughs> Sorry. But when I've seen how much she suffered, I've seen her suffer. As a kid, I used to wonder, God, how come mama spends so much time talking to you, but she suffers? The greatest conversation I ever had with my mama was not in seminary. The greatest theological conversation I had was not at Yale Divinity School, was not at New Orleans Baptist, was not at Reformed Theological Seminary, was not at Princeton Theological Seminary. The greatest conversation I had was with my mama when she said, son, I have a daughter, my only girl. I didn't raise her to be out here. I raised her with God. And she just decided to take her own way. She said, I, I suffer in my body. I, I, I get sick in my body. I, I'm, David, I'm so tired of going to the doctors. I feel like the woman with the issue of blood that I'm just wasting my money at doctor's visits and they put you on this prescription and put you on that prescription and they never give you a real solution. They just keep taking your money and then when that goes around, my teeth start to hurt and I have a root canal. But I, every day I'm praying to God and I'm praying for you. I'm I'm praying for Kali and I'm praying for your children. I'm praying for all of those, all of those. I prayed for your church, but then my body's suffering. I had surgery and then I had to need another surgery and then my hearing is lost and I can't really hear. And I said, mom, out of all those things, she said, baby, sometimes I doubt God too because it's too much. But she said, baby, where am I going to go? Woo! Woo! Where am I going to go? And I'm going to tell my children, I don't care how much you suffer, where else are you going to go? Where are you going to run to? Where are you going to run home and go? Where else are you going to I don't care how much I lose. I don't care how much it hurts. I don't care how bad the season is. Where else am I going to go? I don't care if they put me in a grave, but let them know that where else am I going to go? I'm going to die believing. I'm going to die trusting. I'm going to die saying that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I could ever ask or think. And my mama's life is a testimony to me to let me know that it may not be easy, but you got to have a father that you can run to, that you can call on, that will give you help. tears of sadness I'm crying tears of peace because it does it can feel like it's overwhelming 
it can feel like, man, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if I'm going to. And God's like, that's why I gave it to you so you can trust in me. I didn't ask you to carry this weight. I said, lay it down, David. I said, lay it down. I said, lay it down. I said, lay it down. I said, bring me all your burdens. Bring me all your shadows. Bring it to me and lay it down. I'm going to take it and I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to give you rest, David. I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to give you rest. Don't try to do it in your own strength because you'll fail every time. But when you don't know what to do, you don't know how to do it. Don't get on the phone and tweet. Don't take an Instagram shot. Get on your knees and say, Father, the weight is much. Father, the weight is heavy. And the Lord will help you through. Self-sufficiency. I don't want to trust in myself. I want to trust in you. I want to be out here on the ledge. And I want to be scared every day. I don't want to get to a place where I'm so comfortable, where I don't need you anymore. I don't want to get to a place where I don't pray to you anymore. I don't want to get to a place where I depend on my money. I want to get to a place where I'm always saying, if God does not do it for me, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know how I'm going to take it. And it may be more than I can bear. It may be more than I can feel. But I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. Father, I've said what you asked me to say. Help my brother and sister. carry their cross I don't know what their cross is but help them carry it well when Jesus was carrying his cross and it was too heavy it was a black man an African man Simeon that came and grabbed the cross from him and helped him carry it. I pray may God send you Simeons to help you carry your cross. Woo. I pray God send you Simeons to come and help you carry your cross. I pray you won't cry alone, but you'll have a Simeon there crying with you. I pray you won't walk alone, but you'll have a Simeon walking with you. I pray you won't live alone, but you'll have a Simeon living with you. And if the Lord shall tarry, may he present you faultless until the day of Jesus Christ. You who may be sick in your body, suffering in your soul, you just happen to watch this preacher on the TV screen and you might be saying I don't know how I'm going to make it yeah. if I get one more report or one more email from the school about my children I'm going to lose it God never promised that you would not have trial. But he just promised he'll squeeze your hand while you're in the trial. And I'm going to let you know I'm with you. I want to speak to great people and I'm turning this mic over to whoever's supposed to take it. If God called you to be great, the weight you carry is not for you. 
Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't live for him, he lived for us. And your life is a drink offering. It's not for you, it's for others. And until you accept that, you'll never be at peace. Your life is not your own. It's so others can read and believe. The tears are not even for you. They're to build your testimony. And yes, 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 I wish there was another way that God could use. But even Joseph got betrayed by his own family. Separated from his own family. Sold into slavery. And God called him. Abraham had to leave his family, had to separate from everything he loved. Because God called. Can you imagine if you're a woman and your name is Mary? God gives you a baby and you didn't ask for it. Your husband thinking you cheated on him. In Matthew 1.19, he says, I'm going to kill you because you cheated on me. And you're simply saying, God, why would you put this on me? And then after I give birth to this beautiful baby boy, this beautiful Palestinian son, and at the age of 33, I have to watch him be brutally murdered in my sight. I have to watch my son be murdered at the hands of a system. At the age of 33, I got to watch my young baby that I raised be murdered at the hands of an unjust system. And I've got to be a witness to it. It's more than I can bear. And you might be tired of seeing dead bodies and brown boys drop into the ground. And it almost becomes normalized because we're seeing it so much. And it might be more than you can bear because you're watching it online and you're watching it on YouTube and it's being texted to you. And it almost makes you scared to be a black male because you don't know if today is going to be your last day. And it seems like it's too much to bear. We cannot remain on our own self-sufficiency. We must trust in a God that knows and has seen this throughout eternity and has seen this throughout generations. It is not a plausible excuse just to pray, but it is an acknowledgement that you have a God who is touched by the feelings of our infirmity. And may you be strengthened today. Even if you got married and you thought it was going to be forever. And now you're walking through a divorce publicly and privately. And you're saying to yourself, this is just too much. You may be right, but God will be there if you invite him in. When we go to the gym and we try to lift heavy weight, oftentimes I'll call Joel and say, Joel, this weight is too much for me. I can't do this weight by myself. Yeah. And Joel will come over and he'll spot me. He won't do the weight for me, but he'll help me do it myself. And even though my muscles are failing, he will help see me through. And may the God of peace be your spot this morning. May when the weight of the world gets too heavy, may the God of peace be your spot. May he give you peace until we meet again. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to your faith. Come on, hold on to your faith. Say, hold on to your faith. Say, hold on to your faith. Come on, say, hold on.